Hi, I'm Greg Gordon, and you're watching The Breakdown, live from Pyramind. Uh, today's featured artist is Nimite, and we're going to be taking a look at one of his remixes that he's recently produced. Uh, this is a remix by an artist who originally produced this under the name Joe Muscatello, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, Joe. Joe, so uh, what was the original name of this track, and uh, where did you take it? Sure, so the, the original track is called Liberating Love by, uh, by Joe, by Joe Muscatello, and he... Um, uh, both did the electronic uh, arrangement, also uh, sang on the, uh, he sings vocals on the track, he's a great vocalist. And um, so, uh, sort of as a surprise uh, gift to him, since I know Joe, I took the track uh, recently and remixed it. And there's a story behind there. But. Yeah, so let's take a look at the track a little bit here. Yeah, well, just super simple. Um, I started with the blue tracks here. Um, and, and I actually started with... Um, now those are the original, uh, those yeah. are tracks from his original session? E exactly, they were stem, uh, and actually they were stems, they were, the, they were bounces uh -huh. of the stems, so not his original tracks, but he, I asked him to give me, you can see here... So there's some premixed stems in there. Exactly, uh -huh. LL All Vocals is uh, the, uh -huh. all of the vocals uh, that he premixed. Um, and was there processing when, on those vocals when he gave them to you? 100% of the processing that went into the final track, uh -huh. I had him leave on. Okay. So I wanted it how it was. If I needed something dry, I figured okay. I could always ask him just for that snippet. Sure. But in this case, I didn't actually need it. Okay. Um, and then, you know, there's a, a chiffy lead. A chiffy, I guess, is what he called it. I don't know what that means. Uh, uh, LL stands for liberating love so his original claps some effects some hats and crashes his kick um, some pads some percussion stuff like that so all of his tracks here the stems he gave me and and they all originally were just long audio files that were the entire length of course uh, and then I started cutting them up and moving them around um, uh, and uh, uh, just to see initially I actually tried to make see if I could make a uh, um, a bass line from his original bass sounds just by cutting it up mm -hmm. and I came up with something cool but it just wasn't different enough and mm -hmm. um, to do a remix of this track I didn't want it to sound like the original because I, in my view he already made the perfect song the way it was mm -hmm. and I want I wanted it to be almost like a different genre I think what, what's really interesting for me is as I listened to your remix and I got to compare it to uh, the original one I definitely heard a sound that was coming out of it and I think some of those elements of that sound I hear in Future Primitive too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So clearly he's rubbing off on you. Yeah. What What would you say are kind of the character defining elements that make up that sound? Sure. Well, you know, it's it's possible he's rubbing off on me, but I, it's I'm also like actively doing everything I can to try and emulate some of the sounds because I because when I heard uh, the Kinetic album for the first time from mm -hmm. Future Primitive. I said, that's the sound I've been trying to make. Mm -hmm. Like, I already had it kind of in my ear. Mm -hmm. And the way I describe it is, um, you know, in dubstep and even in some trap and a lot of EDM, you've got some really outrageous sort of sound effect kind of sounds. A and they are clearly electronic, but they have an organic feel to them. Mm -hmm. And what makes them organic is that their frequencies are sweeping all over the place, the volumes are going in and out all over the place. It's the opposite of like hitting a note, like brr, and like just making it sound. It's like uh. everything that can move is always moving. Uh -huh. And and um, what I loved about uh, Future Primitive is he uses all those same sonic elements, but he tells a very distinct melodic story with it. Mm -hmm. And even in this track, I have the, the vocals not in playing the role of lead singer, the, the bass is doing that, but they they're they they're more a backup singer to the bass, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's a sound, that super organic, uh, weird, um, slurpy, dubstep kind of bass sound, but in a, a, a melody line, not just like power tools concussive to your face. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's distinct. Um, uh, that's a sound that Future and Previm and I both share. But also these bass sounds usually have a lot of activity in the high end, uh -huh. uh, all the way up to 2K or even 6K. Uh -huh. um, so a lot of these bass sounds have these zzzz Right, kind of they're buzz. very buzzy sounding yeah, exactly. and they're, they're certainly synthetic sounding yeah, that's right. in many ways. So let's take a listen to a couple of these bass sounds because I think you've got a few different layers going on here. Sure, sure. Let's, let's go into... Um, uh, we'll do, go right into the the first time the the major drop. <laughs>
yeah, it's, it's a great conversation going on between his mantra, the melody and drop of the bass, and then all of the other tinkling aspects that surround it. So there's a whole conversation going on here. But let's get back to the bass for a second. Sure. So what what exactly is playing that line for us right sure, now? Can we solo look, that for a second? Let's do that. Let me find it here. So uh, we have an Omnisphere patch, which is called Bitch Bass, which, okay. I, you know, which I, was, I was immediately attracted to. Uh -huh. um, there's a couple of different um, uh, Omnisphere bass lines that are playing at the same time. And then there's uh, some clips, which are like loops. Uh, and let's play just uh, just the MIDI bass first, and then I'll, without the clips, mm -hmm. and then I can uh, play the clips to show you what they're adding. Okay. So you've got two tracks here yep. that are playing. Both are separate Omnisphere yep, in si instantiations of Omnisphere. Yep. So they sound similar, but this that one's a little thicker. Yeah. And then this one's a little thinner and more like um, sounds more like a saw or razor. Right, right. So you've clearly tweaked the two patches. Yeah. One to enhance the other. Yeah. But they're also I'm noticing they're not just doubling each other. Nope. You've got a conversation going on between the two of those. Yeah, because I'm always looking for the bass to um, constantly be evolving for the bass line. I want it to sound like um, like a natural phenomena in nature versus something someone's played. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, if if I can hear like uh, if I can hear a bass line, wait, that's a little too low here. And if I can hear someone saying, you know, and I can hear it's the same sound being played on different keyboards, I can almost picture the artist with the fingers on their keyboard, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that turns me off. Mm -hmm. I'm like, ugh. Mm -hmm. And if I hear that in my music, I'm not satisfied. Mm -hmm. So I have to then go, okay, well, how can I change each note a little bit so that it sounds more like it's evolving mm -hmm. versus being played, mm -hmm. you know, just as the different frequency of the same sound? Mm -hmm. And also, um, how can it be similar enough so it sounds like a bass line instead of just a collage of sounds that don't really go together. Sure. And that's always the balance that I'm looking for. And is part of that, uh, does part of that involve automating certain parameters of the bass patches? Um, yeah, often, often. So where did we, oh, let's, so let's look at these bass clips. So I automated some of those. Um, so this is like, uh, these are loops which I found on the internet just of bass sounds. Uh -huh. um, and they were long loops that had a lot of activity which sounded like garbage. Mm -hmm. And I just took little pieces that were interesting to me mm -hmm. and then figured out where they fit in the line. So this is just the clips. And some of that has automation already built in. You can hear the... So it sounds like there's some EQ automation going yep, on. for sure. Things. And then you can also see, here I'll go back to these earlier places here. I think it will be here. So if I look at the EQ here, I've automated um, to give it some motion, again, that movement. You can see I've uh, automated mm -hmm. the high cut. Mm -hmm. And then again. And then here again. Mm -hmm. And so this this one here is the same sound as this, but it sounds different. It sounds like the evolution of it. Mm -hmm. And then when you put it all together, instead of just feeling like you're repeating, it sounds like it's evolving. So here we've got this sound mm -hmm. this sound and this sound mm -hmm. and then last which is just a sub bass right to add lowness mm -hmm. and then this one and when you play them all together And I think what makes it organic is you've got different tonalities um, that are having a conversation 
within the bass line itself. So what I've noticed about your tracks is there's, it's like conversations within conversations. Yeah, that's right? Well so you've got like these little micro dialogues going on and each one on its own doesn't necessarily seem significant, but it's how they've been structured to work together right. that makes them really much more substantial. So you can see that in the context of these different bass lines. Well, I had a, I had a lot of um, training in jazz, uh -huh. a, a, in improvisation. Yeah. And so, you know, and, and I was a sax player. Mm -hmm. And as a sax player, when you're, even if it's your solo, you want to leave gaps um, to, for phrasing. Mm -hmm. And when you leave a gap, maybe the piano player would play a little more interest mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. And then when he was done, maybe the drummer would do a, a flourish. Sure. And then the guitar would hit something, and then you'd come back in. So even within your solo, there would be, as you say, a conversation between all the players. Mm -hmm. And that jazz training transfers over to, to this, where I'm like, you know, okay, here's the vocal line, we want to highlight that. And then when that's not happening, what's what's the next place that's going to take the spotlight? Mm -hmm. And that spotlight might move around subtly several times each measure, and then uh, and then each phrase, and then for the whole song. Mm -hmm. So, uh, evolving that conversation, then we let's move from the bass clips here um, to how they integrate um, with the drums, because obviously the two are working in a really kind of cohesive fashion. Yeah. So talk a little bit about um, your approach to the drum programming for this. Sure. So um, I've been really accustomed to actually editing drum samples as clips in the audio program, mm -hmm. which is a super clumsy, mm. painstaking, long way of doing it. Now, do, does this have anything to do with your sound designer <laughs> background? Totally. Uh -huh. Totally. Uh -huh. I mean, for I spent, you know, the first seven years in audio, I was working as a sound designer using Pro Tools, uh -huh. where if you had a footstep, you had a footstep file, and every time the foot hit the ground, you had that file in place. Right. And then you could tweak it with EQ and pitch and stuff like this to make it sound organic. Right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And so it's... Um, uh, it's a very, well, it's like building the Taj Mahal out of toothpicks, you know, it's very... Yeah, very, it could take a little time, <laughs> huh? I sometimes, you know, for people who um, are not musicians, when they ask me what my style, like my, what my creative process is, and I sometimes say I'm like a, I'm the sound version of a pointillist. You know, uh -huh. those, those paintings that are made just by little dots of paint. Sure, um, sure. So I take these little tiny sounds and put them all together. Uh -huh. So I didn't want to keep doing that. So this was uh, one of the first times that I exper experimented using uh, uh, using drum, MIDI drum programming, uh -huh. um, and I used Battery, the, okay. the software to do that. So uh -huh. the track starts out with good old four on the floor. Took two. So you got two different pitched kicks here. Two, yeah, and it's actually uh -huh. two different files. Uh huh. Um, where'd it go? Here. And then um, I added just here. I think it is going to be. Yeah, there, right there, I added the Uh-huh. On the kick track itself. Well, maybe I have moved it. Oh, there it is, yeah. It's it's just in battery, so this is Okay, kick. sure. Uh-huh. Um, and then, and then when, um, when it, that's in the intro, and when it comes out of the intro and comes into the song itself, I wanted the kick to get bigger, mm -hmm. and rather than do volume automation and EQ automation, I actually just built another track. Um, so that I could use each, you know, either one, depending. So then it goes into this. Much beefier kick. Mm -hmm. Let's see what we have here. So here we have uh, just your, I started, uh, I start with just what's my basic beat, the kick and the snare. Mm -hmm. Now I'm hearing some flams on the snare. Is, is that actual delay? delay? Is yeah. that a delay you put on there? It's a uh -huh. delay, yeah, okay. which I think probably I put it in battery rather than uh -huh. here. Uh -huh. It's actually, yeah, it's an effect that's in, in, battery. in battery itself, sure. right? Uh -huh. um, and I just, honestly, I wanted it to be more squishy. Um, probably if I had more time, time on the project, I would have picked a, um, a snare that had a more like a... Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by squishy. It almost like sounds like cracking celery. Yeah. Because um, I like that sound, but uh, I always, when I use it, it ends up being distracting. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm trying to put as much of that sound as I can without it distracting. Because the more your brain is thinking about the music, the less your body can dance to it. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm looking for a snare that's snappy but has a little bit of squish, and that's what had me put the delay. However, it got really interesting when I, I decided to take the same snare and add a delay from Delay Designer. Um, in Logic. In Logic. Uh -huh. On, and I think I did maybe even two. Oh, this is a, there's the reverb. 
Um, here's the delay designer. So this is a delay designer, which is actually a pretty complex pattern. Uh -huh. um, and then this is what the snare with the delay design designer sounds like. Now I'm hearing some reverse on there. Uh, that's all, like that's in this in the in the delay designer. It's actually in this one. So you have a you have it, the okay. There it the, is. The, yeah. Yeah. Reverse reverb. Exactly. Uh huh. And all those different pitches and all of that's delay designer. Mm -hmm. So it's just that one snare going mm -hmm. through those different pitches. Um, and then I wanted to add even more than that. This is a trick they learned from Rain, is that he frequently will take a super busy, almost considered like a drum and bass drum loop mm -hmm. from Logic, mm -hmm. the ones that come with Logic that are really busy. Sure, like a jungle loop. Exactly, uh -huh. totally. Uh -huh. And he'll cut and he'll. Um, He'll squeeze it, so he'll do high, pat, high cut and low cut uh -huh. um, to make it almost like a low frequency hi hat kind right. of thing. Right. Okay. Uh, and then he'll cut it up so that it only fills the space, mm -hmm. um, and then together it sounds like this. And so together, it's just adding a little bit of crispy yumminess. Mm -hmm. um, the last thing is... Uh, and are you actively filtering that, uh, that jungle loop that you've got all sliced up there? Um, I just did it. Uh, it's, right. It's, so there it is. There's your high pass and your low pass exactly. on that. Right I tend to use just this uh -huh. EQ. I love this EQ. It's uh -huh. visual. Yeah. I can see it in the track and logic right here. Yep. So I can never forget that it's on and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It automate, automates here. Mm -hmm. And it's super easy for me to just grab one of these and automate it. Mm -hmm. Or um, or even automate it using, um, you know, using these lines, which I often do. Sure. Um, and then uh, there's another... Uh, Almost sounds like a shaker. Exactly, a mm -hmm. hi hat and a little shaker. Uh -huh. um, so together, that creates the creates the drum track. Open my Right. So those other fills, did you actually perform those films fills in? No, those uh, other fills were from the delay designer from the snare. Oh, those are all delay designers. Yeah, there's, so there's no actual. You just hit the snare right on the three, mm -hmm. and then built the delay designer, so it sounds like a fill. So was there some math behind the delay designer design? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's for me. It's always a. Was it based against the BPM of the track, so you would get a desired result? Absolutely. Right? It's, yeah. it's all based on the, in the delay designer. It's all on beats, mm -hmm. and then I started with uh, I I just go started by going through presets and mm -hmm. I heard one that was kind of cool and active but there was too much so I started deleting taps mm -hmm. that inter felt like they interfered with other things mm -hmm. and then so I took the preset deleted about a third of the taps but you beat synced it to the BPM of the track that's right, right. Uh -huh. that's right yeah and then so then it was uh, then what was left felt like this kind of tasty little jazz drummer that was playing with mm -hmm. me. Nice. Um, and that was that was surprise it later there was kind of uh, interesting story about uh, just in the creative process this rhythm of the delay designer snare that was in my head from working on the track so much mm -hmm. um, that later on um, I, I was in this slower section and uh, the slower section here I'll, I'll play it uh, was was playing and, and it got to that part of the measure mm -hmm. and it, I've been so used to hearing that rhythm from the delay designer from working on the track for hours and hours mm -hmm. that it suddenly felt really missing. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up adding a bass lick oh, that played, sure. the, same it played rhythm, the same rhythm. But, um, yeah. but this is it without it. Open my eyes. I, after hearing that so many times, I was like, wow, something's really missing. Uh huh. So then I added in this bass lick in that same place in the measure. Open 
So how did you actually perform that in to match it directly to the rhythm of those fills? With a pencil. So you, With the you, mouse. you went in there and Yeah, I just, I just took this. So there was no fancy uh, export waveform to MIDI no, data no. kind of thing going no, on. No, I just heard uh, it in this you thing. Just heard. And, uh -huh. I, and basically, it's, it plays nonstop, but uh -huh. I use the higher notes. You always hear like higher notes as louder than lower notes uh -huh. as accents. So I use the higher notes uh -huh. as a way to accent the rhythm. And that's the bitch bass patch in Omnisphere that uh, you tweaked? This is a different one, I think. FM. Ah, OK. FM Motion M. Uh huh. Bira. Got it. Okay. I think. <laughs> Let's see. Uh -huh. I, I might have changed it. Why don't we just open? This sense. is pop chord synth. Okay. And, and this is another example. You know, um, a lot of times you'll hear us. Uh, you'll be patching through presets. You'll hear like, and you're like, e e e e that sounds uh -huh. like I do not want that in my track. Uh huh. But then um, you add a little bit of EQ automation to it. And now it's uh -huh. kind of cool. Uh -huh. um, so what are you using to automate? Are you is there a controller when you're recording your automation information, um, or are you drawing all of it in? I I will. So I have um, I have uh, uh, controllers that are right on the mm -hmm. keyboard like this, mm -hmm. um, when, and I'll usually I'll start with those, but I find I miss the mark, mm -hmm. and I like it to be perfect. Mm -hmm. So then I will go in um, with the pencil mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, just perfect it. Mm -hmm. So there you it know, is. I'll zoom in like at this mm -hmm. level where it's quite easy to mm -hmm. move it around. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there it is. So maybe just a couple more things uh, before we wrap it up here. Sure. There's a lot of nice little tinkly sounds going on yeah. that, that enhance the, the ear candy component of this. Yeah, this is the Ambira. I was, when I was saying Ambira, uh -huh. I'm like, but the Ambira is the wrong sound. Uh huh. So this is even better than a delay. Uh -huh. um, this is just held notes. This is this is atmosphere. So is that that's awesome. the sample itself that's doing that in atmosphere, right? Yeah, exactly. So if I uh -huh. oh sure okay. Uh -huh. What I've done is started with one note and then added a second and then changed the notes and then added a third. Mm -hmm. When I have um, uh, so sounds like this in atmosphere that have an arpeggio. I found I find it's too predictable to just sit here and hold the arpeggio and it sounds, I don't know, I don't lame, I don't like mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. But if you take it and you change the number of notes you have pressed down for sure. each beat, then the pattern changes and mm -hmm. it's less recognizable. So it can be like. Right, it becomes much more musical at that point. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. And so this is what I've done here. Nice. I'd love to take a look at just some of the vocal processing that you've applied here. Because it sounds to me in many ways like somebody uh, has taken vocals, chopped them up, put them in a sampler, and kind of played them on keys. Right. Um, but tell us what you're doing. How are you approaching this? Well, I started, um, uh, I st again, started with his tracks, which already had a lot of vocal processing on there. So mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I needed to add a lot of reverb and stuff like this. Um, however, uh, when I wanted his track to move more, mm -hmm. I didn't change the tempo. Mm -hmm. We're both at so 140. So tempo is the same. Exactly. Uh -huh. So you didn't have to warp anything. Or... Exactly. Okay. Um, but uh, his chord progression, anytime I worked with the chord progression that he had laid out, mm -hmm. I felt the song moved too slowly. Mm -hmm. So I took the first two chords of the chord progression and just repeated them. Mm -hmm. And then for the rest of the song, came up with a totally different chord progression that moves four times faster than his. Mm -hmm. um, and so... That meant that not all of his vocal lines worked because he'd come to a different note, you know, landing on the third of the new chord or whatever, but I would be back to the first chord and it was sounding off. Mm -hmm. So I ended mm -hmm. up having to change the pitch of the, his vocals mm -hmm. to put it back into the chord. Mm. And here you can see, I actually, so I have the vocal track here and then here I have vocal pitched. So I actually have a different pitch here. Yeah. And <laughs> Living me
you can see anything that's on this track is pitched. So mm -hmm. when you start to get into here, um, your, your vocal line can sound like this. I was caught on the way down. Liberating my love. When I started to cut them up, there's some artifacts that uh, uh, they can sound kind of weird. Like you can hear the cut or you can hear the pitch or it sounds like a female vocal. Mm -hmm. And I spent a little while trying to mask all that. Mm -hmm. But then once I put it in the context of the whole song, I actually liked it. It, it sounded, mm -hmm. made it sound sort of more synthier, or more of synthetic. It does, definitely. And, yeah. and I just went with it and mm -hmm. like highlighted it instead of trying to mask it. But there's all these other vocal tracks at, playing at the same time that uh, are cut together from other parts of his track uh -huh. um, that didn't all meant to go together. And I'm totally changing the timing, what even part of the song. I'm taking things out of the verse and taking sure. from and just building a bed of vocals here. Awesome track, Nimite. Oh, thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, so are we going to hear more Nimite coming out soon? For sure, for sure. Uh -huh. I've got um, multiple tracks I'm working on. Rain and I, Future uh -huh. Primitive and I, are working on two collaborations right now. One is an original, one's a remix, which will be nice. coming out. Nice, that's exciting. And, uh, and uh, there'll be some there'll be some surprise uh, releases for sure. Both some remixes I'm working on and some original tracks. Great, and where are we going to get to hear those? Where do we find them? Uh, right now, the best way, place to hear my music is uh -huh. at uh, uh, SoundCloud dot com slash nimite, nimite which is n-i-m-i-t-a-e which is easy to remember because it's an acronym and what's it stand for it stands for nothing is more important than anything else nothing at all nothing awesome thank you so much yeah appreciate having you here my pleasure yeah and uh it's really great breaking down the track with you thank you and uh looking forward to hearing a lot more Nimite. <laughs> Me too. So. Thank you. And uh, thank you. And I hope that uh, you found something in here that you can use to make your music even more the way you want it. Yeah. And obviously to find out more, just check us out at pyramind.com. We'll see you soon. Thanks.